So as we continue in worship, I invite you to join me for a time of prayer. Let us pray. God of the ages, come near to us now. Blow over us your spirit, your breath of new creation. Call forth our dry bones that they may rise up in resurrection power and renewed vision. Roll away the stones that entomb us and invite us back into the world you have made, redeemed, and dearly love. For by your words of scripture and by your word made flesh, Jesus the Christ, may you be with us, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. And so the second scripture lesson continues with the story that Tucker and Libby read for us earlier. This is a reading still from the book of Exodus, first chapter, verse 22, reading on through the second chapter, verse 10. And it's the story of the birth of Moses. Listen for the word of God. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi married a woman from the house of Levi, and the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. And when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, and she plastered it with bitumen and pitch, and she put the child in it, and she placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. Her sister stood at a distance, his sister stood at the distance to see what would happen to the child. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. And when she opened the basket, she saw the child, and he was crying, and she took pity on him. She said, this must be one of the Hebrews' children. And then the child's sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. And so the young girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. And so the woman took the child and nursed it. And when the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. And she took him as her son. And she named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, I want you to remember this quote. There are years that ask questions and years that answer. The quote comes from the novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God, by the African-American writer Zora Neale Hurston. Nowadays, I hear lots of people say that they just don't know what tomorrow holds. Kids are going back to college, but will they be safe? Schools are now going to do online learning for nine weeks, but what comes after that? Can the family own business? Can the local restaurant? Can the Renter who's behind in their payments survive another three months or more of this pandemic? What does the future hold for us here in Pittsburgh, in America, frankly, in the world around us? The year 2020 is shaping up to be a year that asks questions. Think about it. It has already asked us fundamental questions about the way we live, the choices we make. We've long been living as a consumer culture, but what happens when buying things doesn't solve our problems anymore? We've long lived as a a tourism culture, flying everywhere, burning lots of fossil fuel in the process, but what happens when we can't travel safely to new places? For decades, we've relied on a flawed, inequitable healthcare system that's inefficient, That's a wash in paperwork that doesn't provide basic care for every American. The pandemic has heightened all the problems in this system and it's raised the serious question, can we do better for everyone going forward? What can we learn from 2020? 
2020 is a year that asks questions. And maybe this entire year was meant to be a time when we would finally ask ourselves some important yet hard questions. Must police brutality against people of color always be allowed? How can I slow down the busyness of my life so that I can truly stay connected with the people I love? If church is no longer being defined as one hour a week spent inside a sanctuary, can I discover new ways to live out my faith and new ways to live into God's presence that's near me all the time? Maybe the silver lining of 2020 is that it's calling us to ask these questions without expecting an answer right away calling us to grapple with and to think about and to pray over these things so that perhaps 2021 can be, in Neil Hurston's words, a year that answers. Now, far be it from me to speak for God, but I have it on pretty good scriptural authority that God is known for taking the long view of things. There's a famous verse from 2 Peter about how one day is like a thousand years to the Lord. Psalm 90 talks about how from everlasting to everlasting you are God. God is always focused on the big picture, moving from the dawn of creation within a plan of redemption that touches every generation of human history between right now on to the horizon at the end of time. Now, sure, our focus right now might be on August 2020. And yes, God is both aware of and concerned for us right here and now. But God's awareness and God's concern is shaped by a larger, big-pictured perspective, one that is seeking to bring healing to the world, to bring fullness of life to as many people as possible between now and that end-of-time horizon. We need to let that concept sink in. So, for example, today we heard a story from long ago, a story about the birth of Moses found in Exodus chapter 1. But Exodus isn't the first book of the Bible. Genesis is. And Genesis starts with the bigger picture story, a story of the seven days of creation, of Noah's family being saved on that small ark of Abraham and Sarah being called to a new land, of their son Isaac and Rebekah giving birth then to Jacob, who with his wives gave birth to the children and the sons that would become the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. And one of those sons, Joseph, would be the one to rescue the Hebrew people in a time of famine by bringing them to safety in the land of the Egyptians. That long history of Genesis doesn't stop and go away once we turn the page and start reading Exodus chapter 1. And suddenly in Exodus 1, there's a new king in town, a new Pharaoh who doesn't remember Joseph and frankly who wants to destroy all of the Hebrew people. The God of creation, the one who shapes this long view of history, now runs into a Pharaoh of anti-creation, a Pharaoh who wants to thwart God's plans with his own idea of destruction. Back in those days of Moses then, a year's worth of questions were on the lips of every Hebrew family. They routinely were praying to God and asking, how long are we supposed to endure the harsh taskmasters who are ruthless in their demands, who are literally turning us into slaves in this foreign land. God heard those questions, and so God acted to bring them answers. And the answer came through five women, two midwives, a mother and her daughter, and a princess. And in each case, they had a choice to make, and in each case, they chose life over death. It was as simple as that. And that formula worked for them and still works for us today. Pharaoh's first edict tried to turn two midwives, Sipra and Pua, into murderers. 
He said to them expressly, if you sit on the birthing stool and you see that the child to be born is male, then kill him. Now that edict went against their core values. It went against their community identity. It went against their very faith. And so they found ways to refuse it, to choose life over death. So when that plan didn't work, Pharaoh went further. And he said, throw every male child into the Nile, but save all the females. Decreeing a genocide that if it would have been acted out, would have eradicated the Hebrew people within two generations. So in that day, Moses' mother did place her male child in the water, but this time she placed him there in a papyrus basket and set him afloat with a prayer on the waters of the Nile. And though the Pharaoh's law was intended for everyone in the land, Pharaoh's own daughter then chose to rescue a crying baby boy who floated by her, like the other women choosing life over death. And effectively, by her action, put an end to her father's own ruthless and heartless decree. Now, three things guided all five of these women. Compassion, justice, and courage. Compassion. Compassion led those midwives to honor their calling to protect the vulnerable children entrusted to them. Justice. Justice led them to insist on doing what was right as opposed to any policy of death or any feeling of helplessness and despair. And courage. Courage prompted them to speak truth to power, to act faithfully, to choose life over death. It's a simple three-part ethical formula that still should guide us even today. Daily, we need to ask ourselves, will this action I choose show compassion or not? Will it be just for all or not? And if my choice is going to go against and challenge something that's unrighteous or oppressive that's been imposed upon us, can I muster up the courage to do what I ought out of my own faith and trust in God's plan? I'm a big fan of Barbara Tuckman's writings, especially one book that she wrote many years ago called The March of Folly. Now, in Tuckman's book, she describes the times in human history when governments acted against their own best interests, stubbornly sticking to counterproductive policies, even when there were other options available to them, and doing it through a succession of leaders, even when there were other voices telling them that they were wrong and they should choose a different path. Folly is pervasive in human history. Pulling a giant wooden wooden horse into the walled city of Troy was an act of folly. The decadent behavior of the Renaissance popes that eventually provoked the Protestant Reformation was a long season of folly. The British incompetence in their treatment of the new American colonies and the American ineptitude in pursuing the Vietnam War for so long are examples of folly. Too often we don't learn from history. We act in ways that are short-sighted, that are impatient and self-destructive. Long ago, The king of Egypt tried to destroy the Hebrew people through policies of genocide, but his folly only led to the actions of five women who together ended up rescuing the baby Moses and then set him on a path as God's agent who would both free all the Hebrew people and ultimately bring down the house of the king of Egypt. And centuries later, King Herod, would again try to murder all the young Hebrew male children in the land. But the child Jesus, through the help of angels and family, would escape and come back to free an entire nation from their bondage to sin and to break the chains of all oppression. To gain that big picture perspective is crucial when you're trying to navigate a difficult season a year of hard questions. 
Big picture perspectives can be found when we remember fundamentally God is the Lord of all times from the beginning through this day and to far into the future. But in the same way, we need to remember that God works in surprising ways, sometimes subversive ways, planting seeds now that will only bear fruit in years to come and using unexpected people as agents for holy change. In this divided political season, we need to remember that God is no respecter of person and no more aligned with blue states than with red states. God has been at work in our land, in the young people protesting in the streets of our urban cities, but also in those households in rural communities where families are struggling to pay bills and avoid opioid addictions and somehow find their place in a changing, difficult global economy. Demonizing the left by the right or demonizing the right by the left serves no purpose for God's larger plans. Remember what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing the things that are. So let the one who boasts, boast of the Lord. God used two surprising unheralded agents, two midwives. God used a Hebrew slave and her daughter. God used a princess in the palace who could never sit on the throne herself in a male-dominated kingdom and brought them together to protect the life of one child, the infant Moses. And years later, God would again come into the world in an unheralded carpenter's son from Nazareth who would live and teach and heal, who would serve in humility and grace, who would die and be raised to life that all the world might be saved and set free at last. So if 2020 is going to be a year of questions, then let us all recognize the difference between short-term questions that we ask to serve our own interests and the long-term questions we are called to ask to serve God's plan. The women in the book of Exodus who helped birth a new chapter in God's plan for history call us to ask ourselves those simple three questions. Is your choice compassionate? Is it just for all? And do you have the courage by God's grace to act on what you believe, to speak truth to power, to choose life over death? We need new midwife schemes. We need faithful acts of defiance. We need to trust the big picture so that a new world may yet be born this year and for all the years to come. Amen.